what needs to be done to translate into actual solutions on the ground, not just in form of policy, not just in form of finance, but re-transformation on the ground. It is something that requires leadership. And we're not just talking about political leadership, we're talking about the power of agency. We're talking about recognizing the roles that everyone plays in a very coordinated and a collaborative partnership. And that is why we will want to take this conversation forward. But I also want to use this opportunity to invite you. So this is, this is not a program, this is not a project, this is not an association. This is a network of like-minded people who have decided or who want to be at the center of thought leadership. And you're gonna be hearing a number of fantastic ideas today. I'm really privileged to, to have a group of friends and colleagues around the, uh, in the room today, and we're looking forward to it. But look, I also want to say that it's going to be uh, learning is doing, by doing it for us. Some of the things we hope to do is to connect to some of the bigger dialogues happening out there. It could also be some of the new knowledge streams happening out, out there. But what is important is we want to see a group of young and relatively old, and not too old, people at the, at the front lines of thinking differently. The key word is thinking differently, particularly when it comes to solution and transformative actions on the ground. I especially welcome you to this event. It's gonna be a conversation, please, at some point. We will definitely want you to contribute to it. So without much ado, I would like to turn over to our moderator for this event, Dr. DBC Araba, and he's gonna introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. You thank can you. now clap for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Funshaw. Uh, can I ask that you just grab a chair and, and join us on, on, on the stage uh, on, that, on that end? Thank you very much. Um, our, our appreciation uh, to the Climate Leadership in Africa Network um, for organizing uh, this, this convening. Um, my name is Debbie Sierra, but I'm a visiting research fellow at Imperial College in London. I'm Nigerian, I live in Kenya, I've done so for seven years. Um, so I have my skin in the game, shall we say. Um, so I'm, I'm not too far removed from the dance floor. Um, now, we're, I know in, 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 in Funcho's um, opening, opening remarks, and thank you very much for that, you've talked about thought leadership. But I think we, we might be doing a disservice to, to the eminent speakers on this panel uh, if we limit their, their skin in the game to just thought leadership, they're practice leaders as well. Um, and so as I make my way, uh, as we make our way uh, across the panel, uh, could you individually, uh, beginning with you, Linda, of course, um, just share with us um, a summary of your leadership journey, uh, where you are in your headspace, um, and what you do. What's your day to day, and how are you um, working uh, to ensure that we have uh, a more prosperous uh, Africa, uh, not just for this generation, but for generations to come. Over to you. Uh, thank you. I think being the first one to go is always the hardest um, because I don't have someone else's remarks to build on. But <laughs> <laughs> my name's Alinda Ogalo. Um, I'm currently a NOCUP, uh, which is part of the Norwegian Capacity seconded to the IGAD Climate Prediction Application Center. I've been a NOCAP um, staffer for about, since early this year. Before that, I was part of the IGAD staff for almost a decade, served with the, um, I'm in the Climate Institute. Before that, I was in the Peace and Security um, area. Uh, in terms of leadership, um, I'm currently the chair of the Eisenhower Fellowship, the Kenyan chapter. Um, I've been uh, in leadership, I think, by default. I think being uh, part of the continent, and especially a continent that, and a region that's um, largely uh, not, we don't really get a lot of female scientists, so to speak. So I, I, I think being uh, most, in most of the rooms that I enter into being the only female scientist um, by de facto, I, I almost ended up having to step into roles that I didn't necessarily think I would. And also coming from a legacy of leadership, my dad was the founding director of the institution I currently work for. So I think both 
kind of have thrown me into leadership, trying to figure out um, what does it mean to be um, African in this space? What does it mean to be an African woman in this space? What does it mean to be a woman in this space? And what does it mean to try and change the conversation from those different perspectives? So I've, I'm learning how to wear many hats and learning to see um, how is it that we can pull more of us in terms of more of us of color, more of us um, of, of who are female, and just trying to, I think, where my head is, is trying to see what does it look like to see females lead in a space where I haven't seen anyone look like me lead. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that, Linda. Uh, Hubert, um, now Linda's talked about bringing the very best of herself into the space. So it's not just uh, about the day-to-day. -day. I think exercising leadership is always fraught with these challenges where you are not necessarily addressing technical problems. You're addressing adaptive challenges. You know, you may not quite understand what the problem is and even what the solution could look like, but you're thrust into a position where you have to carry people along. Now in your role, you know, I think I, I really like the idea that Linda started with. How have you, you know, exercised leadership, but also, you know, what do you see in exercising leadership as it relates to being an ally to women in science or women in the professional space? How do you carry everyone along to ensure that, you know, your, shall we say, your awesome masculinity? <laughs> Doesn't, 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 become, doesn't become the focus, you know? We see, we, see, we see you and the mission versus you and the label that, you know, your physical embodiment maybe uh, carries. This is an easy one, Hubert. <laughs> it started to be an okay question, but it ended up being a difficult one. I'm not even able to build on what you <laughs> you started, uh, Linda. But um, no, but first of all, thank you very much for organizing uh, this convening. I mean, beyond the, the friendship and, and, and the dedication to climate action, I think um, leadership is experienced in various ways. And um, at least for my part, uh, I, I will answer the questions the way the way you 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 structured it. Uh, uh, but I will give also a bit of background about um, what I've been doing. Um, I'm I'm currently so supporting foundation uh, work, um, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation for um, public finance and partnerships on the continent. But of course, climate is a big docket of um, the, the, the work that I'm doing. I think that's why actually they, they wanted me to come. Um, so there's definitely leadership in my day to day because we need to it's Africa, you, you, so, so it's, it's you, extensive travel, so you have to sell your ideas, your programs. And, but uh, when I look back, I was also interested by my previous roles to be also at leadership. And, and one example is uh, I was also, also the, the CEO of the Green Fund, the Rwanda Green Fund, in which, I mean, it's a national climate fund where you, you have to mobilize resources, you, you, you have to manage teams, uh, young men and women. And, um, but to say the least, um, that, that particular role was actually interesting because in, before me uh, joining the fund, it was actually a coordination fund. So I was really at the helm of institutionalizing the, 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 the National Green Fund. So pushing for programs, developing new instruments in climate finance, uh, uh, making sure that uh, we, we, the dialogue with the donors, the donors community was smooth. And, 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 and of course, as, um, as an African, as a young African in Rwanda, I was always worried about sustainability of you know, our funding. 
because you are a basket fund that keeps asking for more or requesting for more uh, uh, funding against programs, against facilities, and, and you don't see an exit strategy besides uh, more, more funding. So that was number one challenge, trying to make colleagues understand that this is not just environment here. Actually, that's why I was brought into, because uh, I had the finance, the development finance as experience hats. I had some level of sustainability investments, not fully green, but somehow green, and convince pure environmentalists that in this game, if you want me to help you, You'll, ho you'll have to understand also my language. Mm. Vehicles, structuring, investment mobilizations, blended beyond environment, gender, youth. Mm. And um, that was the hardest because you, 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 you have experts in agriculture, nothing against agriculture because <laughs> <laughs> experts in... Um, Water, water sanitation experts in forestry, mm -hmm. and for them, they are just used to the day to day. Mm -hmm. So, imagine someone uh, uh, not to say that I was coming from Wall Street, but from the banking sector, from the finance sector, trying to bring the, some levels of development, some entrepreneurial mindsets by setting up new programs, new instruments, and trying to convince not only a room or an institution, but an entire sector from a minister who also has his political hat mm -hmm. and doesn't need to understand everything, but also to the young men and women that were in the sector. So to me, that was the number one challenge. And I had to find a way in um, pushing for what I had to push Good or bad, um, it's only today <laughs> that they're all coming back to me. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know that this thing you're saying, that today we're applying this, you know that even up to now, I was just coming from the pavilion where they are presenting their, their new plans of mo resource mobilization. We didn't have a clue, but we had to, to learn because now this donor has reduced his funding, this guy is no longer providing, uh, so those are the realities that we've been exposed and we're trying to, 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 to provide. But to be honest with you, um, that's an example of how do you strive in Africa, within a certain sector, within various experience altogether, and trying to package and sell something that will somehow provide goods and benefits for one, your country and the entire stakeholdership. Now, to, to your point about the genders and how we, we have to manage, I think uh, I was lucky, I mean, enough because of my upbringing to not necessarily make the difference between the who's who, the gender, and to, to the contrary, trying to bring any, anyone's inputs. Uh, 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 to the table and, 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 and trying to make the best out of it. So I think it requires also a bit of discipline to not trying to mix um, interests mm. and, 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 and to ensure that because you, it's not because you're in, in, a, in a leadership position that you will need to take advantage. Uh, that will be a betrayal to my upbringing, yeah. which has a lot of dignity in it, as probably good or bad religion believes in respecting human beings the way they are, right. not about where they're coming from, Correct. neither their gender, uh, 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 to the contrary. How do we work together to achieve an optimal result? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Hubert. Uh, Dwight, now, Hubert was talking about engaging with people from different backgrounds and trying to not, not quite herd cats, but you know, get people to face this difficult reality. 
because that's what leadership is, is necessary for, right? People need to face a difficult reality and then we take action. Um, from your experience, how successful or where, 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 what areas have we found success in? And where are we lacking where we need more heavy lifting, shall we say, in exercising leadership uh, for climate action specifically? Do you have a, got a mic? Well, is this on? Yes, it is. It is. Um, I'll just say a little bit about my background and how I found myself leading and working with young people from around the world and giving them leadership opportunities um, because that is what we are doing in the new entity we're putting together called World Climate Core. And uh, four of my colleagues are here from Morocco, Kenya, and Spain, Adnan and James and, and Sarah, and also from Nigeria, Funcho. Um, I probably first started learning to become a leader as a Peace Corps volunteer at the age of 23 in a small village in Central America. And uh, one month out of university, I'm in rural Honduras, and Peace Corps gives me three months of training. <laughs> and at the end, I'm a history major, by the way. Not, okay, no, but not an engineer, not even a beekeeper, a history major. Peace, Peace Corps sends me out, they call me a rural community development specialist. <laughs> Big words. I'd never lived anywhere rural. I could not have defined community development, and I sure as heck wasn't a specialist in anything. But I can look back on that now, 40 years later, and go, well, they really threw me out there into the deep end, but I, I sort of had to lead. I, I had to, and, and by lead, I mean um, take risks, push myself, try new things, listen, communicate, bring people along when it seemed for the best, and follow the others when it seemed for the best. Um, without Peace Corps telling me it was a leadership development training program, it was maybe the best leadership development training program I had because it really um, set the arc for the rest of my life. And when I started the Earth Corps program in Seattle 30 years ago, bringing young people like these three together from all over the world to do environmental restoration and conservation work together, um, they too, at young ages, 23, 24, leaving their countries, flying around the world, learning how to work in teams with people very different from themselves, um, were, were challenged in similar ways that I, that I was in Peace Corps. And when I think about the climate challenge, and I could not agree more that it is a leadership challenge, um, when we think about all eight billion of us using energy in wildly different ways, soon, real soon, than we ever have before, uh, pre <laughs> growing, preparing, transporting, eating our food in very different ways than we have or we do today. I mean, these are big things, and so, we're gonna need political leadership, but we also need people who are gonna lead in their families, in their businesses, in their neighborhoods, with their spouses, with their kids. And I think some of those same skills I was lucky to learn, how to listen, how to collaborate, how to trust the wisdom of the crowd and that the more people who contribute their ideas and feel some ownership are gonna take you forward, um, I think we're gonna need that in many, many millions and perhaps billions of ways. Um, and all of us in this room probably aren't gonna get much credit for it. There are gonna be some folks up on high, whatever, I don't care, but we've gotta be doing that. Correct. So I'll leave it at that. All right, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Dwight. I think, you know, the calling out the individual agency, and that's leadership. I think leadership is, a part of a dimension of, of, of climate leadership is ensuring that people understand they have agency. Individual action is going to be required here um, for us to get where we, we hope we're heading, <laughs> a more prosperous future for the world. Now, Yemi, you, you've, you've, heard, you've heard what, you know, Dw Dwight's story, I, I really like this, you know, swim or drown. <laughs> You know, how, how is, it, is, it, is it the eagles that, you know, just toss their, their young ends off, out, out of the nest and they either fly or, you know, uh, well, go, go, go splat. Um, it's glad to see that you're soaring. Um, Yemi, 
you're, you're in a technical role, you know, leading in Ekiti State, uh, the, in the Ekiti State government in Nigeria. But even as you have that technical role, you also have to show leadership because you're working in a, an administrative function, engaging with politicians who have a four-year political cycle in mind. You have to deliver on something that has returns, you know, for decades to come. How do you, how do you manage that, you know, long-term outcome in a short-term political context? How do you ensure that you buy yourself enough capital to get the work done within that you know, environment that you operate in? Thank you very much. Um, so maybe a bit about my background. I you know, come from a very science background, chemistry. Lots of time in the laboratory developing methods, systems, procedures. And after that, you know, did the master's, did the PhD, and decided to go lecture. Did that for two and a half years. And I asked myself, all this research we, we are doing in the university, how is it translating to practical realities? You know, how are we using this research to solve problems? And so I decided to take a step into strategy consulting, thinking, okay, maybe if we turn research to strategy, you can actually make a difference on the ground. But again, I realized that these strategies good as they are, sometimes when you don't have that frontline engagement with people, you tend to lose perspective as to how to solve the problems. You tend to think you have all the solutions, whereas there's a lot of native and indigenous knowledge that is actually with the people you're trying to solve the problem for that you can gain a lot from. So that, you know, step to take, you know, kind of like a risk, like uh, Dwight said, and engage in a technical role in um, you know, a state that is kind of uh, semi-urban, very agrarian, uh, very forestry dep dependent, and try to solve practical problems. And that's where it comes. Uh, that's where your question you know, links to this. So I work in a sector which involves correcting um, age-long problems, uh, such as deforestation, and also flooding and erosion control. Things that take a lot of years to, you know, to grow and show return on investment. And you need to demonstrate that there are short-term wins as well as long-term gains. And when you have a four-year political cycle where the governor is trying to win election in the next four years, then you see the kind of challenge you have. And if you understand our political context in Nigeria, uh, you have elections, and then you take some months to do litigation, and by the time the governor is fully sure he's the governor, <laughs> that it's got just about a year and a half or two years. <laughs> so so that's, that's the challenge. But what do you do? For me, sometimes you've got to be very pragmatic and link your interventions uh, to the politics and demonstrate that if we can design projects that get results for the people, that guarantees um, a return to the politician, you know, in two or three years, then we have a deal. I mean, I was, um, I, I managed a forestry project, and you know for forestry products, the best you can get to start uh, cutting trees and um, getting some kind of gains from it is about seven, eight years if you grow exotic trees. If you grow indigenous trees, you're, still, you're looking at 14, 15 years at least you know, to get something out of it. But the strategy is to ensure that you have strong community engagement. If you can demonstrate to the political leaders that the communities are very engaged in this project, and it starts from giving them ownership. When you have that mobilization component, you know, designed into your project to have a local community-based, you know, local mobilization of people. Politicians like crowd. You know, they like to see crowd. They like to see people turn up for events. If you can demonstrate that you can successfully mobilize the people to achieve a goal and a an aim and 
demonstrate returns, direct returns to the people, show by m &E actual improvements in their life, you know, in their livelihoods, then you can have a win. You can have a crossover between satisfying the political atmosphere, the political context we operate in, and at the same time, getting, getting results. This is thank you, thank you, thank you very much for 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 that perspective, uh, Yemi. I know that the tension remains, and you know, as you've said, you know, you've got to try things. And leadership, exercising leadership, involves testing out ideas, trying it. But of course, exercising leadership is fraught with um, dangers, because there's no tried and tested. If there was a sure way of getting it done, then it doesn't require leadership. It's technical. We might even automate it. Um, you can't automate leadership. Why? Because it, it requires a good dose of creativity. Now, if I was to tell you, I know some of you might have noticed I was scanning the room back and forth. Um, sorry, I wasn't you know, trying to make you uncomfortable. I was counting in my head how many people are in the room. We're almost at a 50-50 split. I think we're just off by one, right? So uh, you know where the one, we're skewing in, in, in the wrong direction, shall we say, but you know, we, we, we tried our best, we tried our best. Uh, so if you, if you see any lady just walking, you might just like, yeah, you, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a seat here. Or, or we kick out one of the guys. Maybe we ask uh, Olumide to, to leave the room and we, we even it out. Anyway, <clears throat> so you've, you, you've heard from, from our eminent um, uh, speakers on the panel. And, and, and the other thing I noticed, of course, is we have a, an almost female uh, audience on this side of the room. I, I don't know. So the gentleman at the back, I, I really don't know. Like, I don't, I, I don't know what you're doing there, honestly, I, I think. But thank you. Thank you very much for, for soldiering on uh, for, 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 for the men in the room, um, not to make this a, a man's day. And as Funcho said in his in opening, opening speech, I think the climate crisis is, it truly is a leadership crisis. Each day of, of COP, we've had themes, and we will continue to have you know, themes uh, in the run-up to Sunday. Uh, of course, we have food and ag on, 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 on Sunday, which is kind of my day. I think it's my day. I, I, I identify strongly with agriculture. Um, but the underlying theme, the, the foundation that holds it all, and the key to all this, is leadership. Um, and these are not technical problems. If they were technical problems, we wouldn't need to fly all this way to Dubai. See, that's the adaptive nature of this challenge, of the climate crisis. Everyone is going to have to make changes that they are not comfortable with. And we may not even realize the nature of the solutions yet. But this is the coalition of the willing. These are people who are coming here either seeking ideas, uh, engaging with people, or if they think they've got some ideas that they want to share. And that's what's going to get us there? You know, leadership exercising these ideas and testing out these ide uh, ideas in the marketplace, public sector, pri uh, private sector, civil society, etc. So now that we, we, we're through with the first phase of this session, I would like to open the floor to our uh, honored guests. Uh, if we have questions, can I get just a show of hands so I know how we, we work the room? Um, I will probably give a microphone to the audience. Uh, so if we've got any questions, please just raise your hands uh, and then we can, we can pose them um, to the members uh, of the panel. Or if you have any additional comments on different dimensions uh, to exercising leadership, we, we certainly would like to uh, hear from you. This is why you're here, not just to be spoken to, uh, to contribute to, uh, there we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a 50-50 split, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> contributions, contributions to how we exercise leadership or if you are willing to share your stories of how you are exercising leadership in your um, area, uh, your sector, your industry, your country, uh, your respective uh, area, then please we'd like to hear from you. Okay, so who else? I, 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 will, I, will, I will hand the microphone over. Anyone else from the room? So we, we just do a, a first round. One. Just one, two, you sure? 50-50, all right, three, okay. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll start here and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work our way uh, in this direction. Thank you. It was really interesting hearing how diverse each person on the panel has been and the roles that you've played. Um, but one thing 
but especially one of the reasons I came in here, um, think about climate action and leadership, is really trying to understand how you're able to bridge the two sectors, meaning the public sector and the private sector in allowing yourself to be successful. How have you been, what are the advantages, disadvantages of engaging in both, and how have you been successful in navigating both? Now, I come from a unique perspective. Um, I'm Nigerian-American, lived in Nigeria, currently in Cairo. So see things in terms of leadership, both from the West African perspective, the North Africa slash Middle East perspective, and understanding how public-private sectors engage from both. So I'm curious to know from your experiences, what challenges have you seen, and how have you navigate, navigated this to be successful, especially given both sectors have to work together? Yeah, no, th thanks a lot, and sorry I missed your opening, Fonso, and thanks for inviting us. And really um, inspired by this topic, um, I think indeed climate change is a leadership crisis. And I just wanted to pick up your thoughts, Dr. Yemi, on, you know, it's about mobilizing, and we want to program, and, and as much as possible, show the numbers. But sometimes climate change does have very complex um, issues to address, yeah? And if rushed, there's a possibility we'll make mistakes that will have repercussions that will be five times worse. So how have you navigated when there is a complex situation where you don't necessarily have the power to mobilize or program to mobilize? For instance, in the Red Plus sector, where you have a lot of issues around safeguards, you have to ensure that the policies that are made are robust and not, you know, not blindsided in any way. So how have you navigated, and I'd like to hear from any of you, how have you navigated where you have a complex situation and as, as the technical expert, you're trying to move the political with you so that they make the right decisions that can shape society. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Hello, my name is Hafiz. Uh, you indicated earlier that uh, we are here in Dubai mostly due to leadership issues because that is what has led us here in terms of climate change. What may be uh, the main reason and what can we do differently? Uh, is it to say that people are more like, uh, person like they are person-centered instead of uh, looking at its issues in a more sustainable and an inclusive way? What are, based on your own experiences, what can we do differently? And then, I don't know, I've just been thinking about a, a weird question. And it's weird in the sense that uh, I keep thinking, well, uh, a female or woman co presidents make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let's, let's take one more question. Are you... Yeah, th thank you very much. My own question is a little bit uh, towards, you know, negotiation. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly ask about the legitimacy of, you know, leadership in the international negotiation program. Uh, how do you see that? Because um, a, a, lo a lot of people, we, we, are, we, we don't see much of expert again negotiating for, you know, countries. What we are seeing now is just... Uh, government officials that doesn't really understand the component of what this negotiation is all about. So, do you think, uh, in that case, do you think the leadership is shaky or what is really going on? Do we need to have more expert negotiating for us or more, uh, uh, you know, government officials because, you know, it's political. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, thank you for this first round. Um, let's see if we can get another round in uh, based, on, based on this. So um, I will remind you of the questions. Uh, the first is, how do you straddle the public-private sector engagement um, working in this world, exercising leadership? Because different audience, different tools, different perspectives, different interests. Um, how do you do that successfully? The second is, climate change is complex. Uh, how have you navigated the complexity of delivering on these longer term um, or, or ventures that, that have, you know, yes, the gains are there, but it's more longer term investments uh, within a short term uh, commitment. Then 
what can we do differently? You know, we have COP28, so by definition, it's the 28th, 28th gathering of, of the great and the good. Um, do we just make this an annual jamboree, or are we, are we, are we, are we making progress? Um, I don't want to get it. No, no, this is not for the cynics in the room, by the way. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is more for the optimists. Um, and then, what are we seeing with, with expertise and negotiation? Um, how's that evolving from your perspective, especially for the COP veterans? I think, Funcho, I don't know how many. I, I think you, at least on the panel, I don't know, you know who else on the panel has been to more COPs than you in your role with the African Development Bank and, of course, before uh, in international agriculture research. Um, what are you seeing? Of course, this is for everyone, but what are you seeing with the evolution um, in, in, in negotiation expertise? So can I get people to respond? And let's see if we can do one, one question each, and then if you have anything to add to everyone else, then you know, we, we, we do that. Can I go on? No, we, it's ladies first. For oh, sure. uh, it always is. F female president. Always is. Linda, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I get to pick. <laughs> and I think I want to go with the COP one because I feel like that's the easiest one. Um, from the Kenyan perspective, at least. Because I remember when I was in campus um, and we would talk about, or at least uh, take apart the Kenyan negotiations. And during that time, the biggest issue was um, governments and uh, diplomats or friends to cop negotiations, to go for shopping, and they're largely missing during the negotiations and decisions that are made that are not exactly impacting um, African countries in a positive way. But looking at where we are today in terms of how Kenya specifically does its negotiations, it does engage in a lot of um, Kenyan uh, experts, both locally and from the diaspora, in terms of consultations, in terms of uh, getting a position, and even in terms of leading the negotiations. So at least for the Kenyan government, I can say that for sure, that that we've come a long way. Um, in terms of other regional uh, bodies, I don't think we've seen that yet. So I, I'm not sure what exactly caused the shift between, I guess that, and maybe it's with the leadership and the leadership interest in climate change, uh, then that then brings um, the expectations of those coming behind to kind of impress and pull up their game, so to speak, which is what we see in Kenya with our leadership first with President Uhuru, and now with Ruto taking climate change as his mantle. Almost every politician now wants, even those who don't know anything about climate change, yeah, everybody wants to plant a tree. So I think it, 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 makes, it makes, the leadership makes a difference. So when you, when you see the areas where the leadership does kind of care, then it, it changes how, it even solves some of those issues of, of long-term gains, because if the president says it's climate, then everybody's climate, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, Funshaw, now you may speak. <laughs> My apologies, but now you may speak. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good question. So, um, Linda, you just took my question away, but I'm going to answer that same question as well. Look, um, I've had the privilege to be the hood furniture when it comes to um, um, COPs. The first time I came to a COP was in 2008. That's 15 years ago. So I've done the last 14 COPs. COP 14 in Poznan. And I'll be honest to you, don't laugh at me. <laughs> I'll be honest, the COP of those days, um, it was a typical science policy dialogue. It would never be for two weeks. It would just be for, at most, 10 days. And then you will have a very robust science dialogue because it was scientists together with negotiators. No politicians, no business people very much. And it was the hardcore of it. So I was privileged because then I was doing my PhD. And part of my research was supporting the negotiation on Red Plus, everything around Red Plus for the Congo Basin region. And I'll be honest with you, today, the cops of today are marketplaces. So the non-negotiation part of COP have really uh, thrived well. They've done very well. They are deals. Uh, you know, they, we talk about the numbers, we talk about the side events. The side events are very successful, but the negotiations themselves, they've been weakened over time. Secondly, and I hate to say this for anyone who's an NGO, who comes from an NGO world, we now have activists negotiating for us. Mm. Please, you don't come to COP to negotiate on rights. You come with fact and evidence. You make your case. You know what we say? We say, we don't, you don't raise your voice, improve your argument. And, it's, and that's it. Because today, the cops of today, 
for a lot of people, particularly people from developing countries, we don't have the science as a basis of our negotiation. It's the story of my grandmother in the village. I, have you heard that story of my grandmother in the village used to have, and I, I, sorry, I, I really don't like those stories, but the truth about it is you have IPCC reports that even our negotiators don't even understand. And how are they going to negotiate that? So what I think we should do is to find and perhaps go back to what the hood model. Find a group of experts. They may not be in the room negotiating, but at least they can help prepare the necessary documents and to be there. Lastly, it's a game of alliance. In those days, we used to have something called Africa Group 77 plus China. And the voices of Africa was completely lost in the group of China, the group 77 plus China. And there was, at a point, we negotiated for an African community, but even then we had Francophone versus Anglophone. And then we have West Africa versus East Africa within it. And because the people on the other side played in divide and rule game, and that really worked. What we need is a powerful alliance, an identity, a common identity, and be able to say, look, there are issues that we want to negotiate. We're not going to negotiate on everything. Pick the one that we want and make sure we're at the forefront of it. I'll keep it there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that brief intervention, Funcho. <laughs> no, I think, um, as you rightly said, I think whatever answers have been provided really encompasses all the questions. Um, I, I don't know if I can emulate on that as well, but what the, 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 um, I would say the natural connector that I see is a question about public and private sector partnership because everything you've just mentioned just you know uh, resonates around um, PPPs and and so one the concept of public and private partnerships are across the board so it's not just about climate does it make it hard to bring it within the climate space? Yes, at least at a certain point. Remember the example, me trying to convert uh, pure environmentalists into a conversation that looks business. Um, though we are all in the business of selling programs, promoting activities, design new instruments that will attract funding to support you know, climate action. So I think where we sit today, COP28, at least for, it's now close to my six or seven, yeah, COP7 for me, more and more it's becoming business oriented, it's becoming I see private investors, I see high network for individuals, I see foundations work, I see big, big, big banks, uh, not only development banks, but private uh, uh, financial institutions, um, committing on their transition on net zero. Um, so I, I think everyone now understands uh, the importance of partnerships and, and collaboration uh, towards achieving um, you know, net zero, or at least supporting the entire transition. So I'm not worried about that. What, what, what actually it's, what is really important is to understand, one, as Africa, for us to achieve our NDC, ADB, AFDB can correct, they have an NDC you know, uh, docket, we need to mobilize more than $3 trillion by 2030 both in adaptation and in mitigation. That's a huge pipeline that AFDB alone, or World Bank alone, or any institution in this world alone cannot do by themselves. So you need collaboration. It will have to be public, private, replicate models that will allow resource to be mobilized, uh, uh, a new partnership to come, uh, uh, and this probably in different sectors. Uh, um, some will be dedicated funds, dedicated partnership uh, uh, for us to achieve um, the three trillion um, dollar goals by 2030. So, rather than the difficulty that it that that 
it might represent, it's actually an opportunity for us to come together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hubert. Yemi, your intervention, please. Thank you. Um, since she directed the question at me, I would um, answer the question. And it, it might have implica implications to all the things uh, that have been asked. There are no easy answers to that, as you may know. Uh, the Red Plus, Plus Project, uh, the state is not part of it, but I'm aware of some of um, the progress being made in Nigeria with respect to the Red Plus. And again, it's forestry. You know, uh, there are a lot of things involved. You have farmers, you have government, you have um, foresters, you've, you've got even cows to deal with. You know, not only humans, you are dealing with animals. You know, and so many things. It's a life problem. And uh, I would say there are no easy answers. It's, it's like a question of life. But again, I try to bring my science background into solving problems. And when we design projects, I think of the vein diagram, you know, that nice little thing with circles all around. <laughs> yeah, she's, yeah, you know, with circles all around and all these interest groups are all the circles, you know. And then you've got to find that middle point where everybody's interest collides some, some, somehow. I mean, it's not a perfect vein diagram because in a perfect vein, it seems like everybody has a piece of the pie equally. It's not going to work like that. But it's to try and get people interested and trying to show them, as we say in Nigeria, what is it need for them, waiting day for me, you know, that kind, that kind of a thing. I'll give a practical example. We were designing a carbon project. And, um, you know, in government, is to involve the government reserves, uh, about 7,000 hectares. And so the government is saying, why do I give out 7,000 hectares for growing trees, just to see trees growing? What's, what's, what's the meaning of that? And at the same time, the Greek people are saying, ah, why should you, this forest reserves, nice soil, why should you just leave trees on the ground and say, uh, just plant trees for the sake of planting trees? You know, we look like a bunch of tree ogres, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> but the idea and the way we designed the project is to try and front load some of the benefits of the future now and kind of discount it. So for example, there's a carbon credit component to the project. Carbon credits don't count until year five or year six, correct me if I'm wrong. But it's to try and say the community has to have a skin in the game, the state government has to have a skin in the game, and the private sector guy also needs some kind of skin in the game. So is to calculate the credits that you accrue over 25, 30 years and begin to pay from year one so that, such that you show the politician that this is actual dollars in your account from year one, even though we're going to back it out in year five, year six, or year seven, but immediately you can deliver revenues from day one. And the law is designed, we, we have regulations around it in the United States, so much so that the local government has a certain percentage, I think it's 20%, 15, 15 to 20%. And it's going to be administered by them through an NGO, which they would nominate in an AGM um, to deal with those issues. So it's to kind of find that midpoint for everybody and try and front load benefits to satisfy the four-year politicians, satisfy the local people who are looking at the land and are saying, why just put trees on it? Uh, you know, if the project design can find that common interest for everybody, you, you have a chance of success. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, they say time flies when you're having fun. Um, <coughs> I, I certainly had fun. I, I thought, oh my goodness, what are we going to discuss over an hour? Um, but as we wrap up, I'm going to be a bit unconventional. So I'm not going to ask you for your sort of pithy one minute takeaway for the audience. Since this is a leadership session, and leadership involves not just success, but also failure. In fact, I would say 90% failure, 10% success. Because if, you are, if you're succeeding more than you're failing, then you're not trying enough. Um, now, here's the provocative question to, to 
um, panel members as you, as you wrap up. And you think about it, whoever feels brave enough can start. So this time around, it doesn't have to be ladies first, but I'm hoping, Linda, <laughs> you don't break the cycle. Um, can you share with us, not necessarily you know, where you feel, but how do you keep hope alive when you're trying? How do you, you know, they say hope springs eternal. How do you keep that light, that fire burning in the face of trying different things to exercise leadership, in the face of what is the existential threat facing humankind? How do you keep hope alive in your own way? How do you keep hope alive? I think in focusing on the work, uh, because sometimes I think if you think about the big picture and the reality and, and what everyone tells you can and cannot work. Or, and I think I had a conversation with a colleague last week who tried to tell me this is how things are. Try and play to how, like if you do not play the game, then you're going to find yourself out of the game, so to speak. But playing the game doesn't, leaves you where you are. So I think it's just doing your best to focus on the work and just hope that it somehow works itself through. Because I think with the climate, I think that the reality about climate change and climate impacts, it doesn't care that the system is broken. At some point, the impacts are going to be so bad, people are going to have to do something. And when they decide they need to do something, there needs to be people who already know how to do something where a lot of this bad leadership, so to speak, will have to step aside because we'll have to need leadership with actual solutions. And if you keep doing the work and keep practicing the solutions, even when you don't have the space to do it publicly, I think just hoping that one, okay, not really hoping for that bad day to come, but that day will come. And when that day comes, you need people who have been practicing off um, or on the back, ground, so to speak, that can then step up and show what they've done in this small arena and bring it to the large arena, so to speak. Right. So you need that North Star that, that, that guides you in, in, in spite of whatever buffets you left, right and center. Yemi? Thank you. Uh, so how do you keep hope alive? It's, um, it's challenging, to be honest. And um, if you walk in forestry, there's a lot of um, uncertainties. I mean, you're not going to be in the bush 24 hours. You're not going to set up camp there. And uh, sometimes you plant trees and you go there and there are some funny things that would have happened. So how do I keep hope alive? It's always to ensure that there is a livelihood component to projects we design. So if, you, if, they, if there's that human part of the project, investment in humans would always pay returns over time. It will always pay returns over time. So when I see the smiles on the face of people, on the faces of people, uh, the farmers, the, the women in the village whose um, livelihood we've improved, I'm like, well, if the trees go down, the families are there that are happier. The children are there that are happier. We've put in that water system there. That school has been improved as a result of this forestry project. And I go to those places and I see those things standing. And when the failure rate is, uh, of the trees is 25% in some places, which is actually very good, and then 60% 60, 60 in some other places, it's almost as if you've done nothing. Um, but if you see the smiles, you know, you're encouraged and you can keep moving forward. Thank you, thank you. So we focus also on for whom. So we do the what for whom. Hubert. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's a tough question. It's, it's not an easy one. Um, but I tend to, to also leapfrog on what he, he's just answered. No, stay true to your DNA. Stay true to yourself. Uh, don't compromise. Uh, we know, we know, we know what we have to achieve in terms of SDGs. We know the targets we need to achieve. Um, do your best. Stay true to yourself. Don't compromise. Um, always keep the end goal in mind and work out the steps 
towards achieving what you can achieve during the time that has been provided to you. Yeah. Staying true to yourself. That's, that's very important. Dwight. I certainly uh, agree with everything here. And, and a colleague of mine always encouraged me to stay focused on the what, not worry so much about the how and the when. Control what you can control. Um, and what I come back to, I, I got very spoiled early in my career because when I came back from Peace Corps, came back to the States, I, uh, I joined an organization of former Peace Corps volunteers who were doing this really crazy thing called U.S. Soviet People to People Diplomacy. So this is diplomacy in 1984. We had a Cold War, we had a Soviet Union, our governments weren't talking to each other, and ordinary citizens said, well, we've got to do something about this. And in 1984, if you said you were taking a delegation to the Soviet Union, your family members, your friends, they thought you were nuts. You weren't going to come back. It's a Potemkin village, all of it. Nobody. There are like five people on the planet who predicted at the beginning of 1989 the Berlin Wall would come down. I can still remember that moment on TV. It just blew me away. This is what we were, what we were aiming for. So do everything you possibly can and know and trust in this that there are bigger forces at work and that that things we might call miracles do, do happen. Yeah. You know? yeah, well, faith faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. So you've got to have faith. Yeah. Not, not looking at the George Michael song, of course, but, you know, I had to. For the culture. <laughs> for sure, you have the final word. You know, how do you keep hope alive? Well, um, the answer is simple for me. Be the hope. Just be the hope to at least one person. Look, I'm not even trying to change the world. I don't think I want to change the world. I just want to change one person. If you can change one mind, and that's all. It's like a seed planted. By the time it grows and germinates and becomes a mighty tree, you may not even be around to see it, but you've done your part. Just... Be the whole to one person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Funcho. Um, as we wrap up again, I know, I know, I'm Nigerian. We, we, we keep extending this, this thing. Um, I want to do a quick, quick roll call of, of the room. So if you can just, if we start from, should we say my, my right to my left? So the room's left to right, but my right to my left. Um, can you just indicate the sectors that you represent, public sector, private sector, civil society, research, academia. Um, so just really quickly, yes. Behind? Public sector. NGO. NGO. UN. Here. Both UN and NGO. Public and private. Oh, great. And private sector. NGO. NGO. Private sector. Both. Private finance. Private sector. Public and private. NGO. Public. Wonderful. Oh, we. There we go. So we have a very diverse group here. Now, Linda, for your sake, you know, I know you started this by saying, you know, you, you, you started your journey feeling alone, female scientist in this space. How, how less lonely do you feel now? That there's an ally, there's a, there's a whole community, there's, a, there's an entire community here, there's an army here. I believe for a brief moment we were outnumbered, I think women, women probably outnumber men in this room right now, um, which is atypical, I think, um, of, of these convenings. But you feel comfortable here. This is normal now. So hopefully this is a sign of things to come. Long may that continue. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>